Okay. Um, well, thank you very much to all our panelists and <clears throat> also thank you to um, all the medical students who are asking questions. So we're going to go right to questions. Uh, Olivia is working on getting everybody moved over so that we can have a gallery view of everybody. Um, I think she's working hard on it. Right now I can't turn on my video so I'm not going to, but I'm sure it'll come on soon. Um, but uh, if Dr. Kobus, Dr. Tai, and Dr. Arendt can unmute themselves, um, then I, I think we will get going. So our first question will come from Elena Haight. If you can unmute yourself and maybe your picture will show up and then we can um, get you get your question answered. Hi, thank you. Um, I don't seem to be able to turn on my video, um, but I'm Elena Haight. I'm a rising second year at Dartmouth um, and I'm curious if you guys were um, considering other anesthesia subspecialties um, and what swayed you toward your field? Um. Absolutely. Go ahead, Eddie, Dr. Kobus. Uh, well, I think, Elena, thank you very much for the opportunity. I, when I finished medical school, I had no idea what I wanted to be. I wanted to be like a doctor and I just, well, and I wasn't sure. And I, and I didn't think I was going, I was dexter enough to be like a very good neurosurgeon or anything like that. But I also, so I wanted to do something that combine, um, that combine action and ability to do things with an understanding of what's underneath it. So I thought that the best combination of that, and you know, that was towards the very end of medical school, even my first year after medical school, because in Venezuela it's a little bit different, the combination of understanding physiology and understanding anatomy and understanding a lot of things and putting them to practice to a level that it that no other specialty does, which is basically control death, if you would. It really, it, it, it was really um, powerful for me because you actually do that. You put the patient into a state of death or uh, insensate, and then you bring them back. And that was very powerful. And it has a very good combination of intensity, emergency, you have to apply your brains and you have to understand the physiology about it. So that's how I went into anesthesia. So maybe Dr. Tai. So, um, yeah, I was uh, actually all set up to do neonatology. Um, I had had, uh, during the summer between my first and second year, had just stumbled into a great mentor. Anybody who's up in Boston, please say hi to, and runs into Boston Children's, Martha Sola Visner, um, was just, just incredible. And um, I did my sub-I in the neonatal ICU at, at a fast track uh, residency fellowship combination set up. And then, I started spending some more time working with some neonatal or with some anesthesiologists, excuse me. And and I realized that you know most of us don't have kind of um, native primary experience with the anesthesiologists, right? I mean, we remember going to a pediatrician, we remember going to our family doctor. Unfortunately, some of us remember going to more acute care settings like the emergency department or others. But if we've if we've done a good job, we a lot of times our patients don't remember us terribly much, at least with a standard intraoperative ex experience for hopefully elective surgeries and such. But you know, I, f I followed Nick Gravenstein around and, and Mike Mayle, who's now up at Penn, and, and a couple other folks. And these folks just bounced around from basically one emergency or pre-crisis scenario to the next. They'd solve a problem, they'd run right next to the, to the next one. And they, they did this for hours on end. And they did it with a smile on their face. And, and not only were the patients grateful, but frankly, so was everybody else in the room. <laughs> the surgeons, uh, nurses, uh, techs, everybody was grateful for them popping in and, and solving anything, everything calmly, smoothly, with a smile on their face. And I thought this was extraordinary. But, but the most extraordinary thing was that they didn't. Uh, these folks I was following thought this was just, you know, it was Tuesday. This is what we do on Tuesday. Same thing we did on Monday, same thing we'll do on Wednesday. I, I thought that was incredible. I also thought that it was great that they didn't have to make a decision. They were up on OB, they were in the vascular room, they were doing hearts, they were doing pediatrics in the MRI center. A really exciting opportunity. Um, the final, the final crux was, for me though, was how much we still didn't know about this and we can keep pouring energy into this specialty for decades upon decades. 
and and still never quench uh, <laughs> um, that thirst for for making things better. I, I thought that was really really exciting, uh, kind of an untapped uh, an untapped opportunity, so to speak. Dr. Errant. Yeah. Um, first, I love the cat. That is just awesome. Um, second, um, so um, no, um, when I went into anesthesiology, um, I started in 2002 and I ended it in February of 2007. So if you do the math, I should have ended in June of 2006. So what happened? Um, when I started my CA one year, I was um, pregnant with my first child and had a baby in December. During that time, um, she had um, Corey, a number of uh, ultrasound abnormalities and they had said that she probably was going to have a chromosomal um, abnormality and they had me choose whether or not to get an amnio and I chose not to. The result was a terribly stressful pregnancy um, during my first six months of residency. Um, which resulted subsequently, um, I had postpartum depression and was out for six months and then returned back into residency um, six months late. So I never felt like I was part of a class. I always felt like the other. Um, no other women were having babies in my residency and I was one of two other women in a class of 19. So I kind of felt like the other. And so when I went up to OB with the obstetric nurse, the female obstetric nurses and obstetricians and stuff, it was like my people. Like I, I had some place that I could be myself, I could be alive, I could talk about my kids, I could, I, you know, um, and my babies and my childbirth experience and be real. And um, so once I had gone up onto the obstetric floor, I knew what type of anesthesiologist I, I, I wanted to be. And I wanted to be there and I've never looked back. Thank you. Fabulous. Okay. Um, Nelson. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Well, I want to say uh, it's been great. I just want to have a question. Basically, at first, I was just want to know what is a typical life of, in critical care, but I also think it's, it'd be great to ask how is it in pain and also in obstetrics. Also value how uh, um, Dr. Katie was very transparent right, um, right now, very real about her situation. Mm -hmm. That as doctors, we were, were expected to be perfect. And it's great to see um, you know, someone in her role to be able to to be so open with us. Oh, thanks. So I think a uh, day in the life question. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, since uh, the initially the question was for critical care, I can summarize it for you. Um, I usually get here uh, when I'm running the unit or when I'm in the unit about seven in the morning. I meet with uh, the team that was here overnight and we discuss the cases hopefully not many surprises. Uh, we look at the most, all of the labs that were drawn around four in the morning, see was there anything that needed to be acted upon quickly. And then we round with a surgical team, different surgical teams between probably between eight and nine. Then we do formal rounds from nine, around nine to 12. It starts eating into the lunch time. People start getting hangry. You don't want that. So you want to make sure that everybody, you know, that everybody has time to do their thing. And then after that, we need to do sometimes procedures. Everything, it's, it, everything it's, it's different. If we have an emergency and in the middle of rounds, we have to run to a code or something like that, which we obviously avoid doing that. And then the rest of the, the, rest of the afternoon is for procedures and for constantly rounding. Intensive care is not necessarily intensive because of we're doing anything magical. We do everything that we do and everything that we do probably in the OR or in medicine, we just do it more often and we check on things more often. Uh, we, be, we, use some, we use technology, but if the technology is there and you don't check it, it's worthless. So intensive care is because you need to be vigilant more intensively, and that's the key about it. If, you, you're, if you're just there and you just waste your time and then you're just visiting professor, you're not gonna make a difference. It's looking at the patient, even if you have minimal technology and somebody that is very vigilant, take that over somebody that is not vigilant with more technology. That's kind of the bottom. So I don't know if that explains what kind of my, my day is. And then I sign out that whatever time it is that I can go and depending if I have an attending or not overnight, I will get phone calls or not. Uh, and that's about it. And I do that for about between four and seven days in a row and just to time for the next uh, for the next question that was can i do i do anesthesia and critical care yes in most academic places 
you do anesthesia around 70% of the time and about 25 to 30% of the time critical care. Most academic places, they give you one week of critical care a month and the rest of the time you do anesthesia or research or something else. But most anesthesiologists intensivists in academic places do both. In private practice, it depends. It depends on who runs anesthesia group and who runs the critical care. You may have to choose between one or the other. So I think that answers both questions. Thank you. Maybe Dr. Arendt next. Yeah, so um, first, I think it's important um, that for OB anesthesia, you don't, there are places that do it, but I, I really feel strongly for myself not to just do obstetric anesthesia. Um, the types of emergencies that you have in OB anesthesia, if you're practicing a full high-risk main OR practice, you're going to see those more often so that you've had, you know, a bunch of hemorrhages in your hepatobiliary cases down in the main OR where you've given 12 to 15 units. So when that woman starts to bleed at 2 a.m. and you're on your heels, you, it, it almost is like that massive resuscitation is just part of what you do every day and it's very instinctual. Um, same with airway emergencies um, and, uh, and so on. So the, the, the tightened, um, you know, arrests and shock and so on. So the type of things that you're doing in the main OR, um, you do so often that in OB, sometimes you will only see them every once in a while and you need that practice uh, uh, to be second nature um, in order to be able to do a good job. So um, in the end, I uh, also work um, in the hepatobiliary rooms. I work in an endoscopy suite, which is tons of airways stuff there and the hepatobiliary, tons of hemorrhage. and um, uh, also just uh, GYN surgery, um, urology surgery. So I think it's nice to make sure you don't get too narrow in whatever you decide to do. Um, uh, second, as far as um, what a daily life is for somebody that's practicing OB, when you cover OB, you're covering in a shift. So you cover for a 20, you know, there's a 24 seven, seven day a week period that always somebody needs to be there, unlike elective surgeries in the surgery center, which may go Monday through Friday, um, during a, a particular, you know, eight till five. So essentially some, my husband's always like, it's like you tripped at the finish line. Like I see all the, all your colleagues, like not working weekends and evenings and you're always working weekends and evenings. Well, of course that's because OB babies happen 24 seven. So um, I, I think um, Miguel could speak that ICU is like that too. I mean, 24 seven coverage. Um, so, uh, uh, and uh, the, the other thing is that you show up and you can have a quiet day or you can have a day where you're barely hanging on. Um, so you're taking whatever comes into you during labor and delivery. So that's some of the unique parts about a day in the life of an obstetric anesthesiologist. So before Dr. Tai answers, I want to point out that we are beyond time. If you need to leave, please leave. I want to ask our panelists, if you've got a few minutes and can stay on, we've got lots of questions. Yep. People would love to keep going. Okay, we're gonna keep going, but if you have to leave, just go ahead and leave. So, uh, uh, Dr. Tai. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a couple different scenarios. The first is our, is our regional anesthesia acute pain service. We, we run a pretty busy service. We'll have a census of up to 50 to 60 patients a day of patients who have nerve block mm -hmm. catheters in place. So, um, so our day actually starts the day before. So around noon, the day before, we start coming through the OR schedule and the OR schedule is now for three different towers. So it's 100, 150 people sometimes on that list. Mm -hmm. um, and we start looking for, for patients who surgeries look like they're gonna lead to severe pain after surgery. Um, and we have a pretty busy orthopedic oncology service, but also sometimes our hepatobiliary service and thoracic service. So this not only involves looking at the OR schedule, but we look through the imaging for the patients. We look for the documentation of the patients. We call the surgeons every day. And not just to say, you know, what nerve block, but it's really, what are you doing for this patient? What isn't covered in your documents or imaging that may or not be present yet? So that we can really try to tailor our, our plan for putting nerve blocks into patients and, and organize our day. Uh, the day itself starts <laughs> um, around five o'clock when we start looking at the updates, usually orthopedic trauma that have uh, emergencies that have come in overnight. And by six o'clock, we're rolling to start um, putting nerve blocks in and, and we've headed into work in the meantime, um, called and updated surgeons, et cetera. So then we'll, we'll put blocks in people um, from, golly, we usually have our first one starting between 6.15 to 6.30 until six, seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. And it depends on um, 
kind of the urgency of the situation, the volumes, et cetera. We, a lot of our late afternoon and evening nerve blocks are, are older patients with hip fractures. Um, but we can put nerve blocks in so that they're much more comfortable just laying in bed. And, and sometimes those days are a little long, I'll, I'll be honest with you, but it's so rewarding. And it's rewarding for the patients. It's rewarding for our, our nurses who, <laughs> who come up to us and say, can you please come you know, see this patient and help us take care of them? Um, junior residents from surgical service saying, uh, can you please come help us with this patient? I see you folks at our institution, you know, can you please come help us with this? I, absolutely, or, or humble and honor to. Um, and it really, uh, you know, it's not that it's a long day, it's you look at the clock usually at the end of the day and you're like, whoa, it's already, <laughs> it's already six or seven at night. Thankfully, we split those longer days up with shorter days. So we have a team that comes in and augments and just to help up with the busier time of day. Mm -hmm. We we actually found a long time ago that we can do one or two weeks of those long days or, or call days, but um, we get the work done, but we're just not very happy, compassionate, collaborative people at the end of it. And so we kind of self-regulated to say in order for us to stay positive and um, compassionate and you know, have to put our best face forward, we'll, we'll try and self-limit those, those call days and long days. The ORs start a little different. We, in the operating room, mostly take care of, again, orthopedic patients. That's just how our, how our hospital layout is kind of set up. Um, and it's nice to get to work with the same group of surgeons on a regular basis. You get to learn all the nuances and stuff, and they learn yours, and you really develop a nice cohesive team over time, which, which is great. I, I can't underscore how, how wonderful that is um, to develop. Sometimes it's really big orthopedic surgeries, hemipelvectomy. Sometimes it's relatively straightforward surgeries at our ambulatory surgical centers with healthy uh, young adults having knee meniscectomies and such. But I have to say more and more patients keep getting sicker and sicker and, and they still have to have the surgery. They're, they're fractured, they, they can't stay like that. We have to, we have to help them. Um, and so the, the learning curve still, still stays up. Um, we still, you know, we, we do a lot of work with needles and ultrasound um, from all different specialties, uh, but most of it is in orthopedics and frankly, that's what hurts the most, um, thoracic surgery following shortly after that. Fantastic. Um, Kylie, I think you have the next question. Hi, so my name is Kylie Anderson. Um, I'm a, I guess, rising fourth year uh, at the Mayo Clinic, so down the road from Dr. Arndt. Um, so my question uh, is related to, uh, all you guys mentioned the, the research that's going on in your field. So how have you been able to take the research that you're doing or your partners are doing and actually push them forward in uh, education and in uh, practice gui guidelines for your department or like how have you gotten them uh, to change your day to day? So, I don't know. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Aaron. Yeah, no. Um, so uh, there, there's, uh, there's different ways, and Miguel can speak to this as well, but um, one, you can change it for your practice, but also you can be involved in changes um, at your society level, which result in changes for lots of people's practices. Patrick, I don't know if you're involved in your ASRA group and so on. Um, we have an ongoing collaboration with ASRA right now um, uh, that... Uh, um, I'm working on, um, with a couple of people from SOAP on the guidelines for thrombocytopenia in pregnancy, so low platelets and when you can place an epidural um, and, and so on. Um, and, uh, and then previously we had one on anticoagulants in pregnancy that ASRA had previously done. So being involved in those, you actually, your research, your knowledge base, um, even if not, even if you haven't done randomized controlled trials in that specific area, your knowledge base is then used to contribute to the guideline formation and so on. Um, and you really influence practice. How do you influence practice in your own? Well, our OB anesthesia group is about seven of us and um, we change our protocols every six months all the time. Um, things like how we do uh, regional anesthesia for external cephalic version has evolved five times um, um, based upon evidence since 2010, literally. And so we've changed our protocol five times. Um, fetal surgery, I do a lot with fetal surgery. Um, and uh, that is under constant revision because they're constantly creating new surgeries that we've got to figure out how to keep that baby anesthetized and how to keep that uterus relaxed and that mom safe and resuscitated. So, um, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. It's very, very 
easy for our group um, in OB anesthesia because we've got a small group and we just say, hey, what do you guys think of this? And then we collaborate um, with our colleagues to find out what other institutions are doing. Um, again, keeping those relationships and then we recreate the protocol, put it online and that's how we're going to try it. And then we retrospectively look back at that and hopefully we've done a lot of that where we published what our outcomes were um, and then say, okay, we're going to change it, keep a quality dashboard, all that kind of stuff. That's actually a really satisfying part of our practice, that implementation. Katie, yeah, that's, that's very similar to, you know, uh, what we do a lot of, just a slightly different environment. Um, you know, one of the, uh, just to build on what Katie said, one of the big advantages of our particular research in terms of machine learning and data science is also a critical appraisal of, say, our risk scoring system. So we'll get a bit of evidence that comes through. And, and it may have made the cover of the New England Journal of Medicine or of JAMA. And then the question is, well, that's, that's, that's helpful. This is good knowledge. How does this apply to the patients in front of me? How does this apply to this individual? Where does the evidence support this patient robustly? And where does the evidence really fall short? One of the really alarming things we've seen is this strong potential for bias in our risk scoring systems and our models and such across different segments of the population where we can, um, our models have differing strength across different subgroups of the patients we take, we take care of. And I think historically we've been a little agnostic or blind to that. Um, machine learning has really pushed it to the forefront because of just how scary powerful it can be. Um, but it's forced a reappraisal of, of, of how we do this. And, and frankly, it's led to this idea of shared decision making. So in many cases, I'm not telling the patient what to do. Um, I say, this is, these are the decisions in front of us. This is what the evidence suggests. This is what our experience suggests. But, but I don't know what's important to this person. I, I'm not them. I, you know, there are some, maybe three or four different outcomes they're interested in. They, for instance, they may want to be uh, comfortable after surgery, but they may not want to have much nausea. They all, may also want to be very safe. A lot of our patients want to get back to work right away. And sometimes that involves getting back to the field right away. And they're willing to tolerate high pain because they've lived with that for decades. So it's really how do we customize that to them with making sense of the evidence that we have in, in front of us. Um, that's what we consider forward translation, where we take evidence that was generated in maybe the lab or in, in retrospective cohort studies and such. And we do this and, and we apply it to patients. We're also increasingly involved in back translation, where we take our clinical experience and observations and bring it back uh, to our basic science colleagues to help them design better experiments. So, um, you know, my daughters are, are younger and, and it's interesting when they're going through their, their science in elementary school and they talk about the scientific method. And, and it starts off with making observations, right? You know, I saw something and I, and I want to make a hypothesis of that. We, we have a lot of observations to offer um, just based on what we see on a daily basis. But some of, the, some, of the, some of our colleagues who are best equipped to help us explore those observations and understand them aren't in a position to make those observations themselves. And so having that conversation, that dialogue, helps us complete that, that translational loop. It creates what we, we consider a learning health system, where we, uh, we take care of patients, we, we learn about what happens to those patients, and then we take those observations and feed it back in to update. As Katie mentioned, we're iterating every three months. Not every iteration works. <laughs> um, sometimes we're basing it on evidence. Sometimes we're generating evidence based on what we've done. Um, we're not always publishing our negative results, frankly, like we should probably. It's hard enough to publish our positive results sometimes. Um, but we are iterating uh, in some direction almost daily more formally, at least quarterly or so. And, and that's what makes it fun, right? I, mean, I, I can't promise the patient that we're gonna get perfect care and we're gonna get a perfect outcome, but darned if we're, not just me, we are all gonna try. And they've got you know 20 or 30 of us all working hard to try and do our best for those folks. And that's a really cool place to, to be in. Dr. Kobus. So just, uh, uh, I'm kind of an overview of how I see research and, uh, if you are familiar with the show uh, Storage Wars, uh, you <laughs> kind of go in there and you are, you, you, all right, so, and then if you, in Storage Wars, you, it's kind of basic research, put it that way. And in basic research, sometimes you need to open many doors to find something. And because you're usually not dealing with humans, it's okay to do that. So imagine that you're opening many doors and then you find something that is of real value. That's kind of your basic research. Um, in clinical research, it's completely different. You have to start a little bit of a question. 
and or something that you don't like. Sometimes it's not a question but something that you don't like. And that I think Katie was referring to that when she said about the guidelines of her own department about changing things. It's like, okay, this is okay, but we can do it better. Yeah. And that is that then you start to develop a you know a a way of doing things differently. And you do that in the scientific method by saying, if I do this different, am I gonna obtain a different result? Which is completely different than opening many doors. It's more of a focused, trained way to go about things. Now that works for guidelines, it works for QI projects, it works for QA projects, it works for, for reduction of risk. It works for a lot of things that may not be incredibly famous research. Now, if you're gonna do a, right now, like a title volume trial in 2000, there are very few of us here that can say that can lead a research project like that. That is, you know, research from big, 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 this is the major leagues. Most of us are about probably A or double A. Most people that publish are about A or double A. The major leagues are the people who publish, you know, sepsis trial, the John Weaving son of the world, um, that type of thing. But you start by asking those little questions and you start by doing little things and tweaking them out. All of a sudden you have enough data to say, hey, other people may wanna know about this. And that's how you get your stuff there. And there is a lot of pressure in academic medicine to publish something there. So I also warn you that a lot of what is out there mm -hmm. may be just stuff that people need to be promoted. Mm -hmm. So be careful about that. Uh, concentrate on the questions that you really one answer and look at that. And if you really know about your stuff, say, okay, these are the patients and this, I can relate to this. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my overview on how to relate to research and how you can put it inside your, you know, your little organization, whatever it is. Okay. Um, okay. And I'm just going to take that opportunity to make a little pitch for our journal clubs. Our next mm -hmm. one's next Tuesday. All of these people, all of these fabulous leaders in anesthesiology talk about applying the literature to their practice. Mm -hmm. You can only do that if you understand how to read the literature critically. So that is the point of the journal clubs that we're having. We already had two medical students yesterday demonstrate that medical students can indeed read the literature critically. Um, and, and that is why we're doing that. So um, just, just a little pitch for journal club and how important it is for applying research to your practice. Um, next, we're going to have Christine Shen. Hi, thank you again for your presentation. Um, my question is um, for Dr. or Professor Tai. Um, I just want to ask um, how you entered AIML research and um, what kind of advice you would have for someone interested in combining AI, AIML with anesthesiology in their career, perhaps through research or innovation, et cetera. Uh, well, Thank you very much for the question. Um, you know, it was a complete accident, Christine. Um, so if you look mm -hmm. back at my Calc 2 score as an undergrad, nobody ever would have thought I would be doing anything that involved any type of mathematical function ever. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, that's not hyperbole. Um, what ended up happening is uh, I was taking some stats courses for a master. During my fellowship, I was also taking a master's course in terms of learning more about clinical research and how we can do this. And I was going through more advanced stats classes. And um, it was great. I was learning a ton. Uh, I'd get this OR schedule each day, and I'd have to predict who was going to have severe pain the next day. And I thought, wow, this is great. We have a lot of data. Surely we can figure this out. And every single st stats method, I was basically told, you can't do this. You know, there, you're violating all these assumptions. It's not possible. Uh, you know, stop asking this question. It's, it's, it's impossible. So, well, no, that doesn't seem quite right. And so I cold called a bunch of math folks and computer science folks across campus and just saying, hey, I was wondering if you all had any new ideas. And, and there is this uh, professor up in the College of Business, actually. His name's Haldun Aytug from Turkey. And uh, he said, wow, that sounds like a cool problem. Uh, let's chat sometime. So, um, I, you know, we arranged to meet um, at a local barbecue place, interestingly, across the street from the hospital. I show up and, um, you know, I've got me meeting a full professor. I've got my tie on and I'm dressed up. It's July, it's hot as anything outside. And he in walks this guy in flip flops and a t-shirt and shorts. And I thought, huh? And for the next three hours, I got a tutorial on statistical learning theory and I didn't understand any of it. And so we kept having discussions over and over. And I thought, wow, 
this is, I can actually do this. Um, the tools are much better. It, it, um, it's, it's actually possible. And I, I think I'd put a lot of barriers in front of myself thinking nobody with my mathematical skills could ever do this, right? I'm, again, I refer you to those Calc 2 scores. Um, but in looking around, I was never going to invent uh, the next Google algorithm. <laughs> um, but at the same time, uh, a lot of us were struggling with this. I remember asking folks, how do you do this? Um, and they, this machine learning thing, and they're like, machine what? You know, are, are you talking about car building a car? And I said, no, it's, it's to you know, do computer algorithms. Like, what does a machine have to do with anything? It, I mean, this is just how base it was back when it started. I'll never forget submitting a grant uh, on machine learning, and it was rejected. And years later, I was meeting a very esteemed member of the academic community who then shared with me that they had reviewed my grant and said that um, the topic of machine learning just sounded like such a stupid idea, and why would anybody waste their time in, in research in that area? And I was heartbroken. He said, I, you know, that just, you know, that, that Patrick, that was just so foolish. What were you thinking? Uh, I felt pretty bad about that. Um, I don't think I was terribly wrong in hindsight. It seems like there was something to machine learning after all, but this is just, this is where the field started. Um, and you know, we just kept chipping away at it. I, I spent a year fuddling around with it and my very nice advisor said, let's just talk this year up to good experience. You learned a lot. And uh, even though if you didn't publish anything, despite lots of effort. And we, we kept trying, we kept working at it. And we, we built a great collaboration network. I'll, I'll tell you, Christine, most of the reason we fell into it was because we worked with a great group of folks. We enjoyed working together. Um, the fruit was hanging so low that you could pick it up off the ground. Um, but you had to recognize that it was something that maybe would have some value in the future. Um, even if you didn't quite understand what that was right now. Um, and, and one thing led to another. Um, I think it's also a lesson in the fact that no one person can do this on their own, right? It's, it's a little bit of hubris to say, golly, I'm gonna read some books and know how to do this as well as a computer science professor who devoted 12 years of training just to this topic, no way. But at the same time, it's also hubris for them to say, you know, well, I read a book about anesthesia last night, so I understand all the implications. Um, no, you know, we, we, we had to learn a lot of these lessons the hard way, but together, um, and frankly, the more disparate backgrounds in this area, the better. Together, we create a lot of great uh, questions and hypotheses and, and really energizing, exciting research. Um, and I would encourage you, don't, don't look at what's neat or cool or in vogue now. Look, one, at what's really exciting to you. And two, look, look over the horizon. You all are at a great place in your career to start looking at the stuff that hasn't, that's not there yet, like quantum computing. It's not always going to be a six million dollar computer, right? And it's going to devastate the limitations that we have and really open up a lot of doors. But nobody understands what to do with it yet. So, so there's an opportunity. Um, uh, GWAS, PWAS, and all these other things where we say, ah, you can't do this because of X, Y, or Z. Jump in and start tackling those problems. Um, yeah, it, it, it wasn't intentional, and I didn't have the pedigree for it, but neither did anybody else. And so we just kept trying and, and together as a team, we made it work. Does that answer your question, Christine? Is that helpful or? Yeah, it definitely uh, did answer my question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And Katie and Miguel, if, I mean, I, I, you know, you all have, have great perspectives too and it's kind of seeing this come off from the clinical perspective. Uh, I don't know if you have any other thoughts to share. On machine learning? No. <laughs> No, I don't. I, I, uh, we have, you know, each department has a group, but that's not something that I've, I've, um, I've worked with. So, but I am incredibly impressed by it. Yeah, me too. My only experience with AI is with a, a movie with Tom Cruise, I think, and most, <laughs> of, you, most of our <laughs> audience may not know about it, but I think that's how, but that's why I like to, to learn and listen about it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Is Harriet still on? I think she. If I think she may be having technical difficulties. Oh. Um, Mega, are you still on? That was our next question. Guess not. Um, if anyone else had a question, 
I'm trying to look through here. Kylie? I think we went through that one. Okay, I think everyone's dropping off slowly because we're nearing 11.30 here. Um, thank you so much to everyone for attending. Um, and this recording will be up on the website. And I'll share my screen real quick to show you our next sessions. Olivia, I'm sorry before. I think there is a question here that somebody, oh, go ahead. Lydia, Lydia, it's on the chat, it's on the chat section. Yes, hi. Still around? I, I'm oh, okay. still here. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so my name is Lydia Duval. I'm a fourth year medical student. So my question was for Dr. Kobas. I was wondering if you could kind of explain how drastically are the differences between an anesthesiologist uh, working in the ICU versus maybe a doc that came from internal medicine and did a critical care fellowship or pulmonologist. Um, how drastically different are, are those skills? Well, I think the main difference is I think is that we're better, but let me tell you why. <laughs> well, so, let me explain this. So a, a pulmonary critical care doc, it's a, that fellowship is three years, mm -hmm. okay? We only have one. But the three years, uh, the, the three years I spent, one, maybe one and a half in ICU, the rest of the time is doing pulmonary and uh, research, right? So these are the doctors that will take a lot of, uh, this, this, they take care of the COPD, asthma, and the other, uh, eventually some of them may go to do some uh, subspecialty in lung cancer. But uh, these are the, your COPDers and, and, and asthmatic doctors. Some of them practice both. Some of them go and they just do one. They do mostly pulmonary with a lot of bronchoscopies or they do mostly ICU. So, but some of them do both. I, I think probably they go probably 40, 40, 20 um, in terms of the people who do both. And they're, I mean, some of them are really good. I mean, spending three years of residency in internal medicine, three years in fellowship, you know a lot of diseases. Um, there's no doubt about that. I think if you are going to be looking into, you know, mechanisms and things like that of diseases, I think a pulmonologist is pretty good about that. Um, why do I say I think we're a little bit better? I think we combine a little bit better in terms of how active or how proactive can we be? You know, we can, you can summarize that in a joke that, you know, I, I actually, this is not a joke, I've actually seen that. I've seen two pulmonary or two internal medicine docs looking at a monitor and a patient in VTAC and they're wondering whether this is from some electrolyte disturbance, whether the patient is magnesium or whether this came from some like side effect of a medication. And I'm thinking, why don't we shock the patient? It's a little bit different, you know, and um, because I'm not really thinking about all the electrolyte disturbances, but I'm thinking about kind of what it needs to be done at the time. And I think that's why I meant the combination of being, of being knowledgeable enough to take action. And I think that's what anesthesia that gives. So I think maybe I, I, I talk too much. I don't want to discredit my colleagues from pulmonary critical care medicine. Miguel, can, can, I, can I say something there? When, when I take a patient up to the ICU <clears throat> that's pregnant, um, in respiratory distress, heart failure, um, just recovering from a massive postpartum hemorrhage, um, we're dealing with uterine acne issues, you know, whatever, coagulopathy, potential AFE, I send it to an internal medicine intensive care unit. That's per the person that's covering. I have a whole different level of insecurity, I should say, than I do when I'm sending it to an anesthesiologist. Why? Um, well, I, I think that when you look at the anesthesia education, you're getting pediatrics, you're getting obstetrics, there's a per certain parts that may not be in, inter in internal medicine, pulmonary critical care type education that are filled in with anesthesia because essentially anesthesia is taken every single person that comes to the operating room, which takes your whole breadth of, of, of population. Yeah, to, to, Katie, to build on that, and, and Miguel, um, we had the good fortune of, of training under several folks who had done internal medicine, and they had the option to do a pulmonary critical care fellowship, and instead just completed an anesthesiology residency, and then did ICU. Yeah. And it was, I, I always thought that was a very interesting decision. They said, well, you know, I, these are folks who wanted to do critical care, and so they, they realized that after internal medicine training, that they were going to get the bulk of critical care, frankly, the training throughout their anesthesia residency anyway, and then do a formal critical care, rather than it just be a marginal component of a, of a different type of training program. Um, and I, I really respected those folks, and they were, they were phenomenal. Um, but I, um, I don't know if it happens the other way around. Um, and so I think that 
that type of trajectory probably mm -hmm. contains some latent information, frankly, as to the value of the anesthesia approach to critical care. I'll also say that um, we do a lot of resuscitations, a lot of resuscitations. It's kind of what we do. Yeah. And the scale and scope of those resuscitations um, is not something that you run into in a lot of other specialties in all of medicine or pediatrics or whatnot. Surgery, I think, has not encountered for them since they're, um, shall we say, a part of the resuscitation. Um, Stop. It, <laughs> uh, or starting it, yes. Um, or starting it. <laughs> or starting it. Um, but it's something that's just, um, we, we relate to. I remember a couple of stories of folks who, um, running into some of our internal medicine colleagues who they'd never seen a resuscitation. So they thought this patient, um, you know, should have care withdrawn. And, and we thought, well, it's Tuesday. And of course we do this resuscitation. And of course this patient's going to do well. Um, but if they hadn't seen that, if they hadn't been exposed to it, you can understand how it would be difficult to carry that perspective. And in that particular case, the patient did wonderful. Um, uh, had a liver transplant and were discharged a few days later. Uh, and so I think it depends on what you're going to do. One, one caveat I will say is when it gets to neonatology, I, I, I go back to that. That's such a rarefied area. Um, you know, I actually think it's very interesting how many adult critical care interventions really delved out of this challenge of how do you take care of a sub kilogram baby um, and a baby who frankly is so incredibly resilient uh, through so many insults and, and will likely do well if we can just support them through a, a difficult period. Um, I think that is a little bit different, and I know pediatric critical care is also a little bit different in terms of it, the, the training. It used to be anesthesiology did that exclusively, and then it really went back to pediatrics, and now I think it's actually swinging a little bit back the other way, too, um, because it's at the nexus of so many different um, disciplines. I, I don't know, Miguel, I don't know your thoughts on that. Please feel free to correct and update. You have much uh, more. I, I, I'd rather take care of a patient on 1,500 drips than a than a healthy baby. <laughs> Let me just stay in that. Um, it, it says, and the smaller the baby, the more drips I'll take on the other side. Uh, that's for sure. No, pediatric intensive care is the way of pediatrics. I think uh, there's, there's, uh, there's some anesthesiologists that have done pediatric anesthesia and then can get into pediatric intensive care, but it's not a common pathway. These are people who really like to train. Um, you know, I didn't talk about the practical uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the practicalities of doing only one year of fellowship before uh, before three, you get two years that you defer more compensation. But as a medical student, you maybe not be thinking about that right now. But it also comes into play in terms of when you can you, when you can enter the the market as a as a as a full fledged attending as opposed to waiting for another two years. So that also uh, plays a role. It also depends on what you like. If you have a specific uh, research interest that has to deal with some pulmonary uh, disease or some proteins or anything that you want to characterize. Obviously, that pathway of pulmonary critical care will will serve um, will serve you better. Anesthesia is a very practical fellowship. Uh, most fellowships do not require to have extensive research program or anything like that. It's a practical fellowship. It will give you the stuff that others that other specialties don't have: intubations, fluid resuscitation, lines. You get that during anesthesia residency, so you only fine tune that. And then during fellowship, you obtain antibiotics, nutrition, things that you don't do a whole lot in the OR. So uh, it's a very practical fellowship, and that's after that you can run a unit if you, if you like. Our, our CA ones and twos are um, <laughs> and well versed in resuscitations uh, months into their training. It's not yes. something, I mean, and, and um, that's very, very helpful. I don't think that's terribly unique to our specialty or to our uh, training program. I think that's true in a lot of training programs across the country. It's just the nature of the specialty. And, um, uh, you know, the, that extends, that allows you to, to train on a lot of other areas too um, and, and develop more information because you're comfortable with the emergent and urgent. And now you have some time to really explore your knowledge. So I've got to say, uh, these three, I can tell, would go on answering your questions for three days, and that would be fabulous, but uh, we are well over a half hour over time. Um, I want to thank, first of all, our three amazing uh, presenters who shared their wisdom, and then all of our students who made them dig deeper. Um, I think it's exciting to hear, don't give up, 
uh, don't take no for an answer. Uh, there's, it was great for me to see all the different ways that you can be an anesthesiologist. Um, a reminder, next week on Tuesday is Journal Club at noon Eastern time and on Wednesday, I think, is our um, next panel presentation on path to anesthesiology with some of our up and coming anesthesiologists and uh, Olivia's screen sharing the actual times and dates. It's on Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and we look forward to seeing you there. And um, uh, we don't have a great way to applaud here, but I know you're all grateful to our speakers as, as I am. And I will look forward to seeing you all next week. So thank you. And oh, I was going to say, if you guys want to have one last word, you can all have one last word. <laughs> one piece of wisdom. Your wisdom doubt. Go, go no, to soca, go to soca.org and join. You're going to find incredible amounts of critical care stuff that you're going to enjoy. So please, uh, please do join our, our society. You are <clears throat> forming yourself in medicine during one of the greatest times of service to humanity um, in medicine. Um, keep that, grow that, make the next generation of anesthesiology amazing. Um, what Katie said, <laughs> uh, um, I will, I will also chime in that I understand, especially for, um, for some of our medical students that the next several years are going to carry some anxiety in choosing a specialty or a subspecialty or what have you. Um, one of my advisors pointed out that, um, we are very fortunate to have lots of great options in front of us. Um, I will modify that by suggesting that those options only stay great options if we're really doing it for our patients, um, mm -hmm. if we're really doing it for others. Um, you all have so much so much to offer, so many folks for decades and decades and decades to come, and you will do that in whichever direction works best for you. Um, but but we're keeping that focus on the patients and, and the uh, less fortunate, frankly, that, that we yeah. commonly uh, encounter um, that makes this all work. And uh, I, I congratulate you for, for dedicating your summer to this and hopefully this has been helpful. Um, thank you all very much for the time. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Bye guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Reach out with any time with questions. Yep. Yep. Send emails. Bye. 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 Thanks. <laughs>